Good morning, good morning, church. It's beautiful to see all your faces here today. <clears throat> it's going to be a fantastic day today. Amen. Today we're in the uh, second chapter of Colossians. And I've entitled this message, Don't Be Fooled. Uh, the Colossian church was going through some hard times, but they remained strong. They remained steadfast. Amen. Uh, and even though some crazy teachings were coming in, uh, <clears throat> they weren't they weren't moved by these crazy teachings because they remained strong. They weren't fooled. Amen. Paul is writing this letter from prison. He writes four letters, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and a personal letter to Philemon. Uh, these four are companion epistles, says J. Vern McGee. And together they are called the anatomy of Christianity or the anatomy of the church. Uh, because these four epistles cover all aspects of the Christian faith. While Ephesians is about the body as a church, Colossians is about the head, which is Christ. Amen? Philippians is about Christian living. And Philemon is a personal letter to, to Philemon. Uh, and it's, it's going to really test his, his character as a Christian. We'll, we'll go into Philemon after this, after Colossians, so that we can finish off the, the prison epistles. So, <clears throat> I'm only going to do five verses today. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. So, Paul got the letter. He got a visit from Epaphras, and Epaphras is, is, is telling him what's going on. So Paul writes a letter back to the Colossians, and he tells them this in chapter 2, verse 1. I want you to know how hard I am contending for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. So we, we don't have any record of, of Paul ever going to this church. We believe he never visited this church. It's not in any, it's not in Acts. So we believe that he never went there. So, but <clears throat> Epaphras or Epaphroditus um, is the pastor of this church. And so he goes and visits Paul. He tells him what's going on. Paul writes the letter back. And he says, hey, I want you to know how hard I'm contending for you. Contending for you, fighting for you, wrestling for you. So how was Paul doing this? And what was he doing it for? Can I just tell you that from experience, and I know that there are some of you that may can probably relate to this. When you're contending for someone in the spirit, when you're praying from prison, it's a different kind of prayer. Amen. You you don't pray like you would normally pray. It, it's a it's a kind of prayer that's it's just it's so personal. It's the kind of prayer. Uh, when you know, it's like this. I know people who pray in prison, inmates who pray in prison. And they pray because, because their family is being abused or exploited or is in some kind of danger. And you know that there's absolutely nothing that you can do about it. When my, uh, when my nephew was in Iraq or in Af Afghanistan, my sister would pray. She would pray her heart out. 
I mean, she prayed every night for his safety. She was contending for him. This wasn't normal prayer. This was crazy prayer. So when you're contending for someone who's in danger, who's far away, who you can't see, and there's nothing that you can do because it's too far away, what you do is you get down on your knees and you pray to the Lord. You make everyone in heaven aware of what's going on, and you're contending for them. You're praying for them wholeheartedly. This is a different type of prayer. This is the type of prayer that Paul is praying for. He's in prison. He's in Rome, and he's praying. He's contending for this church because there are a couple of dangers in this church. He heard. So when you become a a master prayer warrior, and when you spend that much time with God, God moves. God moves, amen? He moves on your behalf. Okay? So, Paul hears that there's grave danger in these two cities. And the two cities are uh, Laodicea and Colossae. And the danger was Christianity. The danger was Christianity evaporating into a philosophy, becoming nothing but steam. And we all know what steam does. And it's gone, right? So one of the dangers was all the people are philosophers. Everybody likes to sit around and talk. So either Christianity was just going to come in, they were going to talk about it, it was going to be over, it was going to be like steam, and it was going to go away. It was going to become another philosophy that uh, that uh, just became uh, nothing. Something that came and went, like so many other philosophies at this time. Or the opposite danger was that it would freeze into a form and become a ritual. That is the danger in communion. Either it becomes something that is religion, it becomes a ritual, or it becomes something that we don't even care about anymore. That's why it's so important to, when we take communion, To really come before the Lord and say, Lord, I really do believe that you sacrificed, that you died on the cross. I'm I'm taking into consideration right now, Lord, that, that you were beaten, that you were kicked, that you they they tore out your beard, that you bled, and that you bled on the cross, and that this juice represents. Your blood. You really do that in on Sunday morning when we do communion. And that they beat your body and that your body, your broken body, this bread represents your broken body. That's what we should do on Sunday morning so that it doesn't become ritual and so that it doesn't become something that we just do. So that was the danger in Colossae at this time. It was either going to be steam or it was it was either going to freeze, right? When my daughter was little, I used to teach her uh, fire science. And I used to tell her, Melina, what are the three forms of H2O? And she knew what to answer. She would say um, steam, water, and ice. Gas, liquid, and solid, right? And so, of course, I'm using a analogy uh, that J. Vern McGee, J. Vern McGee uh, showed, I, I read it in his book, but it is a very good one. But it's important to know that Jesus is neither steam 
or ice. So if he's not steam and he's not ice, then he's called the living what? Water. Amen? My advice to you is that you drink plenty of water. You guys with me? Start your day off with water and end your day with water. And, you, and you'll find that you won't be thirsty. Am I right? All right. Even now, Christianity is still in danger. And the closer we get to Jesus, the closer we get to Jesus coming back, we'll see many false teachers come through our churches and through neighborhoods teaching new theologies, new profound revelations. And if we're not grounded in the word and don't know what the word says, on that day, there will be some people that are drawn away. Believe it or not. Because they won't know what to believe. And they'll go to God and cry out and say, God, I don't know what to believe. God, what should I believe? But God won't answer. And they'll cry out again, God, tell me what to believe. But God won't answer. Do you know why? It's all, it's all in here. Everything you need to know, it's in here. God already spoke. He spoke his word. He sent his son. You, you have the word of God. You have the church. We have each other. He speaks through us. So when you, so when those people don't know what to believe, it won't be God's fault. It won't be able to call out and say, God, you weren't there for me. Because in the end day, there's going to be a bunch of people that are going to cry out to God. They're not going to cry out. They're going to curse God. They're going to be so upset with God. They're going to be so mad that they're going to shake their fist at God. They're going to say, you weren't there for us. The book of Revelations talks about these people. But God has already given us his answer. This is how he'll answer you. This is how you'll know what to believe, the Bible. If you're grounded in the word and you read your word daily, When they come up to you and start talking to you, you'll know in two seconds that they're false teachers. You'll know that they're deceived themselves. False teachers, let's see. There may be some that are purposely false teachers, but I believe that false teachers are deceived themselves because they it's hard to teach something that you don't believe. It would be hard for me to teach something that I don't believe. So they believe it wholeheartedly because they were deceived, fully deceived. I'll tell you what. There's a church down the street that I need to warn you about. I don't normally badmouth churches, but this church is active. And... They evangelize all around the 92154, maybe other places. They're called the World Mission Society Church of God. 
And about three years ago, me and Melina were at Walmart. And this lady and her daughter approached us. And we were in the clothes section. I was, th- I was looking at some shirts. Melina was like two racks down looking at some shirts. And this lady comes up to me and she says, Hi, are you a Christian? Or she said, Do you believe in God? I said, Yeah. She said, Do you read the Bible? I said, Yeah. Because I just, you know, I thought there were, these are Christians. So, yeah, of course. What's up? What do you got for me today? And then, and then uh, the daughter started talking to Melina. And so the lady said, um, <clears throat> do you read the Bible? I said, yeah. She said, have you read about God and the mother? I said, you mean Mary? She said, no. I'm talking about God and the mother in heaven. And I was like, oh. She's all, look, let me show you. In the book of Jeremiah. Now, Jeremiah is personally my favorite book in the Bible. I read that thing all day. I'm trying to memorize the book of Jeremiah. Why? I don't know. It's just my book. It's the book I love to go to. So I know the book of Jeremiah and its context and the history. And the book of Jeremiah talks about the queen of heaven. But God himself is talking about the queen of heaven. And he's saying, do you see what these people are doing? They're making cakes with their children, and they're presenting the cakes to the queen of heaven. Now, in history, we know that the queen of heaven is Sarah Manis, the wife of uh, Nimrod in Genesis chapter 10. They're the ones that started all this false religion in the city of Babylon. She's the one that started uh, uh, reincarnation. She says that Nimrod died, was reincarnated, became the sun god, and through the rays, through his rays, he divinely impregnated her, and they have a son named Tammuz, which is also mentioned in Jeremiah. So she starts telling me, look, it says here, the queen of heaven. And I was like, oh, lady, you're really, she showed me four more verses where it talks about the queen of heaven. I was like, I I don't ever talk to people that I don't know like this. But I said, lady, you're reaching. You need to be very careful what you're doing right now. And if I wasn't grounded in the word, luckily, through the grace of God, I, God found me at a time when he did something to me, for me, so where I could read the word and read and read and read and read and read. So that the day that this lady came up to me, because if I wouldn't have known, I would have just went, wow. They teach that there's a mother in heaven, and she's sweet, and she's beautiful, and she's loving, and she's kind, and she, I don't know what she does, but other religions teach that you have to go through Mary. You have to pray to Mary, and Mary goes to Jesus, and it makes almost, it almost makes sense to that you would pray to Jesus' mom, and then Jesus' mom goes to Jesus and then convinces him. So you don't have to pray to Jesus, you have to pray to Mary. And I'm like, whoa. So all these things are called fine-sounding arguments. And if you're not grounded in the Word, that's just one of them. There's going to be more. Jesus tells us there's going to be many false teachers that come in my name. And they'll say, I am he. I am the Messiah. We already had um, David Koresh. I think it was 93. David Koresh memorized the entire Bible. I don't know any men that could do this, normal men. And he said, I'm not a normal man. I am the Messiah. You could go to any verse and he'll tell you what it was. He He memorized the entire thing. David Koresh led many people astray. 
And there's been many men over the years, Jim Jones, many false teachers over the years that have led many people to commit suicide, to drink the, the, the Kool-Aid and commit suicide, which is actually, what is the poison that you drink? Uh, cyanide. It's what it was. They were actually drinking cyanide. He convinced them all to take it so that they could, uh, so they could be rid of this world and the evil of this world, and they could all get to heaven. There's many people that are going to come, Jesus says, in my name, claiming I am he. And if you don't know the word up and down, left, right, I don't want to tell you guys that you're going to be deceived, but that's the truth. You're going to be deceived unless you know the word unless you're reading the word day in and day out. Because if you do read the word like that, when somebody tries to come and say, hey, did you know that Jesus and the devil are brothers? You're going to say, no, they're not. No, they're not. That's not true. Quit saying that. I rebuke you right now in the name of Jesus Christ. You're going to say that. You're going to say, no, they're not. You need to get away. You need to stop teaching that. I'm going to pray for you right now so that you can so that you will not be deceived. There's new, there's new, I just watched a video of these new Israelites that are preaching Jesus, and they're preaching that Jesus only died for Israel. And they have all the verses, and it says, Jesus died for Israel. Jesus only died for the Jews. I'm like, and they're convincing people. They're making videos on YouTube. There's so many false stuff out there. There's so many false teachers and false things out there. Though I can't teach you to be grounded. I, you got to read the book. You got to read the word and the spirit of God will come inside of you. And it will, the written, the Bible says that it's written in your heart. You won't forget it. And you will not be deceived because the spirit that's inside of you won't allow you to be deceived. It will not. Just make sure you're getting a daily, you're drinking the water. Make sure you're drinking the water every day. The book of Joshua says, uh, meditate on it day and night. Read it to your kids. Write it on the doorpost of your walls. Meditate on it day and night. Every night before dinner, talk to your kids about it. This is what it says. Verse 2 says, My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding. So he's contending for them. He's praying for them. He's wholeheartedly getting on his knees. He's probably down there for 30 minutes, an hour, two or three hours. But he's praying wholeheartedly for these people in these two cities that are in danger of losing their Christianity. And he says, my goal is that they may be encouraged in heart. I guess the finest example of this is, is when a football coach walks into uh, a locker room and he gives the team a pep talk and they get all excited. They're encouraged in heart. They're all together. And then they run out on the field and they fight that game. They play that game wholeheartedly because they're encouraged in heart all together. United, sure, they're a little nervous, but they know that as long as they have each other, they can count on each other. Is that not true? Is that not true when we watch these football movies, these great football movies like Remember the Titans and, and all these movies that bring so much unity? There's so much unity, especially in the movies with the 60s and the 70s when there was racism was rampant in the United States and that you have the blacks and white players playing at the same time. And then you see 
how much they love each other. And then you're just all for that team because there's unity. Even though there's racism all around them, inside of the team, they broke down those walls. So this is what Paul is praying for, that they would have that same type of spirit, that there wouldn't be any racism, that they would be together in heart and one mind and one accord. Great generals have done it, have done this in war right before a battle to get the troops all riled up. Because if they don't, if they send the troops into war with a defeated attitude, they're going to lose their lives. So Paul is contending for them. He's suffering in prayer. In chapter 4, Epaphras, the pastor of this church, is also contending. He's struggling. He's wrestling in prayer for them so that they could reach the full richness, riches of complete understanding. In order that they may know the mystery of God. We know that the mystery in the New Testament is the church. When it talks about a great mystery that has been concealed throughout the ages or through, through the years, it's talking about the church. And this time here, it's talking about Christ. Mainly Christ. Namely Christ, it says. Paul does. I was talking about the coach and the general and how they pump up their team and how they pump up the soldiers. Well, Paul does this very same thing, but he does it on his knees. He's constantly praying for them, for understanding. It's imperative that they have understanding. The mystery that had been concealed is the church. The body, when Christ was down here on earth, he had a physical body. Now he has a spiritual body. And you and I are that spiritual body. Amen. We are the bride of Christ. We must come to the understanding of who we are. And who we are is the bride. He is the bridegroom. And one day there's going to be a great big old wedding. And he's going to come get us. And we're going to go with him. For now, he has gone into heaven to prepare a place for us. But he's coming back for us one day. Come on, somebody. Can I get a witness? But just like the parable of the ten virgins, we must be ready. You guys agree? You guys know the parable of the ten virgins? If not, get with Melina and Aaron afterwards. They'll tell you all about the parable of the ten virgins. Amen? Verse 3 says, In whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So, what a scripture. What a bold claim. Jesus is all you need. I believe I, I already have a sermon that's called that. But this is saying that in Jesus is all the hidden treasures and wisdom and knowledge. Because whatever it is you're, you're looking for, it can be found in him. You just have to be willing to believe it, to accept it, and to receive it. In John chapter 3, there's a man named Nicodemus, the teacher of Israel. And he asked Jesus, him and Jesus are having a conversation. Jesus is telling him. Jesus tells him something that trips Nicodemus out. Nicodemus cannot comprehend what he means when Jesus says, 
In order to be saved, you must be born again. And Nicodemus says, I don't understand what you're saying. How do you want me to go back into my mother's womb and be born again? Jesus, have you lost it, man? And Jesus says, do you really think that's what I'm saying? Do you really think that could save you and get you to heaven? That's not what I'm saying. Jesus says, and I'm sure the conversation went a lot longer. I'm sure the conversation lasted throughout the night because Nicodemus went to go talk to him late at night when nobody was looking. And he had this conversation with Jesus and Jesus was more than willing to stay up and talk to him. And Jesus says, Nicodemus says, I don't understand it. And, Nicod- and Jesus says, you're the teacher of Israel and you don't get it. You, you don't understand it. Jesus himself, the son of God, tried to explain to the teacher of Israel what salvation was. In the end, Nicodemus could not accept it. He couldn't believe it, and he surely could not receive it. In Mark chapter 10, a man runs up to Jesus and says, Master, good master, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus says, have you kept all the commandments? And he says, ever since I was a kid, I've kept every commandment. He says, all right, that's good. Now I just need you to do one more thing. I need you to go sell everything you have. And I need you to give the money to the poor. And the man's face falls. And he walks away sad. And we never hear about this man ever again in Scripture. He's never mentioned. He couldn't understand because he didn't have understanding. Even though Jesus told him, you'll have treasure in heaven, he must have thought, heaven? Well, why do I need treasure in heaven? I can't spend it in heaven. There's no stores in heaven. He didn't have understanding. And so he couldn't accept it. There are many things God is going to ask us to do in our lives. He asked Jonah to go preach at Nineveh. He asked Ananias and his wife to tell the truth about something that they had lied about. He asks believers not to take each other to court. He says, if someone steals from you, don't ask for it back. He says, if you wish to keep your life, you must give up your life. Can you accept these things? I'm asking you as a church. Can you guys accept these things? If someone steals your car, that's your only car to get to work. But Jesus says, don't ask for it back. Are you going to go ask for it back? Are you going to go get it back? It's a hard thing to accept. It's a hard thing. Of course I'm going to go get it back. But Jesus says, don't go get it back. Well. I'm sorry. I need my car. I need to get to work. That's our attitude. We don't accept it. We look down on the rich man because he couldn't give up his wealth. Man, Jesus is asking you to be, he's telling you the key to to go to heaven and you couldn't give up your wealth. What about us? Can we accept things? Can we give things up? Because there's tiny things in my life I can't give up. Everyone 
I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. That's verse 4. I hope I explained this next part correctly. Everyone has a giant in their life. That one thing that they don't want to let go of. Pride. Money. <clears throat> prestige. Power. Lust. Shopping. Drinking. Gambling. Fishing. Sorry, Sean. Gaming. Coffee. Your husband. Your wife. Your children. Your giant is whatever you love more than God. Whatever the giant is in your life, you must slay it and cut off its head. Now, that sounds harsh. I can cut out, I can cut out drinking coffee. But what do you mean? How do you mean that about my child? Well, I don't know. That's up to you. That's up to you to figure out. But if you love your child more than you love God, you, that's wrong. And you need to go to the scriptures and find out what I'm talking about. That's what you need to do. I can't explain it to you because you won't, I could never explain it to you. You're never going to walk away saying, oh, that was good. Thank you, Pastor Lynn. No, you have to find it on your own. Harvard business graduates learn that making, in order to become great, you have to make big sacrifices. Big sacrifices. The harder the sacrifice, the greater you become. They must have got this from the Bible because it's all over the Bible. I know you think I'm crazy, but to Nicodemus, Jesus sounded crazy. He didn't have understanding. And if you don't have understanding, and if you can't accept what I'm saying, you need to first pray and ask, then ask God for wisdom and then go to the scriptures. Because the scriptures will give you some hardcore understanding of things. Just study for the next six months. Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Stay, stay in Matthew 5, 6, and 7 for the next six months. And then try to apply it. Try to apply Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And I guarantee if you can accomplish 5, 6, and 7, I'll You'll make it to heaven. There won't be a giant left in your whole camp. And you got to understand what I'm saying. If, if I sound wrong to you right now, you need more understanding. You need more understanding of what I'm talking about. And then you'll agree with me. You're like, oh, I didn't get it at first. Because... Because it sounds wrong how you say it. And it sounds it's it's counterintuitive when I hear it. But if you study the scriptures, as you're studying the scriptures, it's supernatural. God gives you understanding, and you're like, oh, I get it. Whoa, I didn't I couldn't see that before. I didn't understand that. I I couldn't comprehend. In Matthew 5, 21 and 22, you have heard it said to people long ago, you shall not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. 
right? You have heard it said long ago, you shall not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment, it says. Now, Jesus is preaching this. He says, this is what you heard a long time ago. But I'm telling you right now that anyone who is angry with a brother or a sister will be subject to judgment. Now, I'm going to turn around because I don't want to see. But if you are angry with a brother or a sister, raise your hand. Right? Now, remember... That lying is a sin. Okay? So, uh, God bless you. You can put your hand down. You can't even be angry at someone. You can't even be angry at your brother or sister. Uh, yeah, you can. You just can't sin in your anger. No, you can't. This says you can't be angry at your brother or sister. Dang, you can't even be angry at nobody. You don't have the right to be angry at anybody. But you don't know what I've been through. You don't know what I had to endure. You have no idea what I suffered. What I went through as a kid. You don't know what I went through. How can you say that I don't have the right to be angry? Well, I don't understand. I personally can't understand. And I personally won't tell you you don't have the right to be angry. But the Bible does say it. And I don't understand your pain, and I I don't understand what you've gone through. But there is someone who does. And he's willing to take all of that hate and all of that pain and misery from you if you'll just let go of it. When he died on that cross, he nailed all that anger. He nailed all that hate to the cross. And there it died with him. You don't have to hold on to it anymore. Learn how to give it to God because it's a process. You can't just give it to God one day. It's a process of giving it to God. And only you you know what that process is going to look like. For me, I had to, for a whole year, I had to go to the altar, get on my knees, I would picture it in my hands, and then I would present it to the Lord, hand it over. I'd take it out of my heart, and then I'd hand it over like that. And I had to do it every Wednesday or every Sunday. I did it for a a whole year until it was gone. So whatever it is, it's got to be gone. Now, it died with it died with Christ. It he nailed it to the cross, and it died with Christ. But Christ didn't stay on the cross. Amen. Three days later, he rose. Hallelujah! We'll have that sermon next week. Chapter five, verse five says this: For though I am absent from you in body. I am present with you in spirit and delight to see how disciplined you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. Paul really loved this church. He really loved these people. 
this letter was probably very different from the letter written to Laodicea. We don't have that letter. But Paul is commending them for being steadfast, for standing shoulder to shoulder, for not backing down when these false teachers came in. They said, hey, uh, you better go talk to Paul because uh, what's going on? We're not, we don't really know. We need some, some expert advice. But Paul was already praying for them. He already knew that these teachers were going to come in because Jesus had given him revelation. Jesus said, there's going, to people, there's going to be people that are going to try to come in. They're going to try to ruin the flock. They're going to try to steal away the flock. So be careful. Pray. Pray for them. This is happening in uh, family members. Satan is trying to divide up families, break up families. Sadly. My family is broken up right now. Not entirely, but just one piece missing is, is enough for it all to be broken up. And I, I've prayed. I've prayed, but it seems in my, in physically, it seems like it's not, it's not going to get better. But I can't be thinking, I can't be uh, earthly minded. I have to be heavenly minded. That's the only way to be victorious. That's the only way it's going to work, right? Some of us are doing ministry uh, out of the flesh, and it's exhausting. It's exhausting, and we some of us don't want to do it anymore because we're doing it through our own strength. Some of us are being Christians, saying we're Christians, practicing Christianity, but in our own strength, and it's exhausting. I don't want to be a Christian anymore. It takes too much out of me. But the good thing is that we don't have to do it in our own strength. We have the Lord. We have the Holy Spirit. We just have to be willing to believe it. We have to be willing to accept it. We have to be willing to receive it. That's the truth. If you're tired, if you're tired of serving God, if you're tired of doing good, the Bible says, don't grow weary in doing good. Amen? I forget what the rest of the verse says, but it's, it has a good ending. Dennis knows what it is. Who knows what it is? What is the rest of that verse? Don't. For in due time, you will reap a harvest if you don't give up. Amen. Hallelujah. So... Who needs prayer this morning? 